Housing affordability and property booms aren't just modern day problems. Australia also faced a crisis in both respects after World War II and, like today, predictable response was to build more stock. And there was a new building material that fit the bill perfectly, providing a way to build more houses quickly and cheaply. Unfortunately, that product, known colloquially as Vibro, turned out to be deadly as it contained asbestos. And now, fast forward 70 years or so, it's still posing a threat, but this time to a new generation of home owners. Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia and author of Auction Ready. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say on here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of a professional. Don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on the website as well as Download our free full or forecaster report. Which experts can you trust to get it right? The elephant in the room.com.au. In Australia, over 4,000 people die each year from asbestos related disease, and one in three properties still contain asbestos. Worse, there is a rise in the deaths of women in the so-called third wave of do-it-yourself related exposures, and we are still importing products which contain asbestos. Now, this is something that all homeowners need to be aware of. If your property was built before 1987, there's a chance that there's asbestos somewhere in the building. Jill North owned one such house. Jill was a professor of law and diagnosed with mesothelioma. I can't even say, but mesothelioma, an aggressive cancer which is caused by random exposure to asbestos. And before her death in December last year, she had spent the last three years researching the story of asbestos. Jill's legacy is the quest for reform, which Asbestos Awareness Australia is leading. Our guest today is Jill's husband, Martin, the founding director of Asbestos Awareness Australia, a registered charity which they established last year. Now, Martin North is a friend of the podcast and will no doubt be more familiar to you as the founder of Digital Finance Analytics and curator of the YouTube channel, Walk the World, where he covers finance and property news with a distinctly Australian flavour. Now, thank you so much for joining us today, Martin. I want to firstly start by expressing my deepest sympathy and to say how much I admire both of you for making the most of Jill's last years and bringing this issue back into the spotlight. Well, thank you, and uh, really good to come on and talk about this. Jill's view was, once she was diagnosed a few years ago, was that she didn't want other people to go through what she was going through. And the more she researched it, the more she realised that this is a really big, horrible sleeping issue that people just aren't aware about. So what she wanted her legacy to be was to raise the level of awareness of asbestos-related issues in Australia and other countries too, but also drive reform because her view was that uh, every person who dies from asbestos-related disease dies unnecessarily. And, you know, the 4,000 a year, think about that compared to COVID. Yeah, look, do you know... What a woman, for starters. I mean, that that is. There's so many different ways you can you can respond to be giving a death sentence, um, but to respond with that, I think, is just amazing. And so let's use this episode to really, you know, help push this legacy along. Um, the asbestos story in this country is really quite shocking, isn't it? Um, do you want? Can you give us sort of the, um, you know, the thirty second, <laughs> the yeah. one minute rundown? <laughs> yeah. So, so the story is that asbestos was um, mined, particularly in Western Australia, um, some time ago. It was seen as a wonderful miracle product because it was cheap, it was readily available and essentially was used by a couple of major organisations, particularly James Hardy and uh, CSR, and they really pushed this product hard here and in other places around the world. Asbestos became one of the foundational materials used in modern construction. Now, of course, unfortunately, very early on, people started to realise that asbestos was not all it was um, made to be because effectively the fibres are very, very fine and the fibres can get into um, your lungs and they can cause cancer. Now, unfortunately, the first identification 
of the risks of asbestos right, was actually early in the 20th century, right? So it was in a long time ago, right? So this is not recent. Are you talking yet, before the massive manufacture of building products? Correct, yeah. So essentially there was this completely mixed story. On one hand, asbestos is a great product, and, you know, and it's cheap and, you know, it should be used. And, you know, by the way, governments, state and federal, supported that and invested in factories to help, you know, make the product. But at the same time, those in the know knew that it actually was cancer causing as well. So yeah. this is not a new problem. It's a bit like smoking all over again, except the problem this time is that whereas if, if you know, smokers make a decision to smoke, well, it's their decision. But if you are actually exposed to asbestos, you may not know. Now, the first wave of people who actually started to get sick were people who were mining it. Mm. Right, and uh, there's a Whitnam over in over in, over in, over in uh, WA that's now based in an area that's uh, completely um, cleared away because effectively people were living there and uh, you know living amongst the mining community. The second wave were people who were working in the construction industry, either um, manufacturing the products itself or in fact installing the products. That's called the second wave. But the third wave, and this is the one that Jill was caught in is random exposure because you decide to do some DIY, mm. right? Which is what she did. So she worked on a few houses, one in the UK, one in Australia. And unfortunately, she picked up some fibres somewhere along the line. Now, there's two problems with asbestos. The first is it's very fibrous and it can be, um, uh, you know, in lots of different products. We'll come on to that. But the other is it takes a long time for asbestos asbestos related disease to manifest mm. itself and particularly mesothelioma you know mesothelioma can take 30 years to manifest so you could be exposed as a kid and not actually be diagnosed for 30 years now think about how impossible it is therefore to try and track back and work out precisely where you're exposed right? yeah and there are stories of kids being exposed because they played in piles of asbestos that just happened to be piled up right or there were kids exposed at school because they had asbestos in the playground, mm. right? Or um, wives washing their husbands' overalls when they come back from the construction sector and, and getting mesothelioma from that. Mm. Now, th the story then moves on because there was a realisation that, that, you know, this is a really serious issue. So there was um, a sort of ban on asbestos a couple of decades ago and um, James Hardy created a fund in Australia to basically pay out compensation. But you have to prove direct exposure to asbestos, so it really is only in an industrial context that it really works. So there are a lot of people who actually have had exposure in that third wave that can't get any compensation at all. And the second point, of course, is that compensation doesn't actually cover a life, you know. No. Um, you might, you know, you might or might not get a bit of money. In, in Jill's case, we didn't. But essentially what it's been translated to is the way to solve the asbestos problem is to keep quiet about the problem and just pay people off if they get sick. And it's interesting that if you talk to the lawyers who are working in the sector, what they, the first conversation they, they come to is, let's try and find a direct link to an industrial exposure because then we can get your compensation. Right. Now, the next point to say is, in 2012, there was a major report done on asbestos, and basically they said, this is a serious problem, awareness needs to be raised, because it's something which is not going to go away, it's not going to be an old man's disease, it's not going to be yesterday's problem, it's still happening, and it will go on happening. Those recommendations went absolutely nowhere. So, the level of awareness in the community is very low, the level of um, awareness in a number of uh, initiatives run at a state and federal level are very, very low because nobody wants to talk about the third proportion of properties, one third of properties probably has um, exposure to asbestos in some form, right? One third. We're still importing the wretched stuff despite the fact that it was banned. Yeah, well, he, uh, uh, just uh, on that, yeah. what is being imported with asbestos in it? So sheeting, for example, from China with a 10% of asbestos in is not being checked at the borders. Oh, right. Right. Mm. And the other point to make is the survival rate, once you've been um, diagnosed with 
asbestos-related disease, particularly mesothelioma, is the worst of all cancers, mm. right? The survival rate over five years is 6% or something, right? So Jill basically was diagnosed four or five years ago. Um, she went through some very serious surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, had a short period where her health was a little bit on an even keel. And then last year it came back and, you know, there was no, it was inoperable, they couldn't do anything about it. During that period, that period of wellness between the first treatments and the second, because she knew what was going to happen, mm. it was absolutely focused on trying to, one, understand why we've got the situation we've got, <clears throat> but two, try to actually figure out what needs to be done. And one of the things we did was we surveyed households <laughs> on their level of awareness of asbestos. Which you love right? doing, surveying well, households. Well, funnily enough, <laughs> we did use my standard survey mechanism and approach, right? Yeah. And it was horrendous because if you talk to the people who are, you know, involved in the asbestos awareness raising process, and there mm. are some people and there are some people doing good stuff, they're assuming that their campaigns and processes over the last few years have actually been successful in raising awareness of asbestos. The truth from our surveys is most people have no idea at all about asbestos, the risk of asbestos. Most of them think it, you know, is it, it's, you've got to be exposed over a really long period of time and, you know, even then it's unlikely to be impactful. The fact is, it is probably the worst type of cancer that's out there in terms of its survivability and because of this long gestation period you can be exposed but not actually find out for long later and, mm. and here's the final point right how many types of products do you think in and around a, a standard house you know the 1950s and 60s could have asbestos in it well, I'm going to take a stab at that because this is something I do talk about with clients all the time, right? So asbestos, for anyone who hasn't heard of this, it's the it's sort of like the bonding material, isn't it, of of, fi of fibrous cement, right? And fibrous cement is, um, it could be weatherboards, non-timber weatherboards, um, it, sheeting basically that's used in houses. And some old houses, you know, you, you hear about, or you go to Bankstown, you see lots of fibre houses, for instance, the actual is on the outside. Some houses have also got fibre fibre cement walls or fibro walls on the inside as well as the outside it's in the eaves it's in the roof loose asbestos was used for a period of time as insulation so it's just pumped loose into the um the roof cavity it's it's also it used to be used in brake linings because it's very heat absorbent it, it basically absorbs heat so it used to be used in a lot of heat settings my mum still has an asbestos little mat thing she uses, uh, you know, in her fry pan when she cooks her devil's food cake. I mean, it's like, mum, like, really, chuck it. It was used in roof sheeting. So a lot of that corrugate, that real grey, and it looks like it's got fibres in it, grey um, corrugated roof sheeting. It, 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 okay, there's probably others, but that's just some. And, and I see this. I actually went to a house, uh, well, about a year ago, went to a house, um, preview so sometimes agents let us go through the house when the um the photos are being done and if they've organized a building a pest inspection now this is why one of the first encounters with this particular building inspector and why i will never ever rely on a building inspection done by this guy is because i walked out to the back of the house and i saw him pulling at a sheet now, this is an old house and I'm 99.99% certain it's asbestos sheeting. This is a building inspector who should know better. So you're saying households don't know this. It's no surprise to me. Building inspector pulling at it at the corner. And I went, mate, can you leave that alone? That is probably asbestos. Don't. It could be fragile. You break it off. You know, I don't want to be around you when you do that. Um, he said, oh, it's fine. It's a beat up. That was what his words were to me, right? So anyway, it's everywhere. Have I missed anything? You have. <laughs> oh, okay. no. So, so he, here's a few, just to give you a flavor. You, you were dead right what you said, but vinyl flooring, for example. Oh, yeah. All right, lino, vinyl flooring. God, is a, okay. In a lot, a lot of places. Um, cladding, including, you know, baseboards and all those sorts of things. The, the wet area lining, particularly <gasps> in bathrooms. Yes. Right, and in kitchens. Right, the electrical meter board, right, um, soffits, 
You know, the, 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 the return things under the roofs. Oh, I was calling those E's, but yes, that's, yeah. there's a, that's and, and the name. <laughs> that there's an interesting story there. There's a, there's a guy called Matt Werfel who actually uh, ran a case against James Hardy and won last year. He'd actually been doing some uh, work on, I think, um, soffit boards, right? And he was able to prove that it was actually James Hardy um, materials that he actually got his mesophilioma from. Wow. He actually won the case. And for the first time, the judge said that James Hardy was not doing sufficient to raise awareness of the risk of asbestos. But they that, haven't that's, changed that's, anything since then? Well, not, not so. In fact, James Hardy tried to appeal it, and uh, the appeal was chucked out. So it just shows you that, you know, this, this, is, this is a... We, we're getting into a, a big corporate issue here, right? Mm. Let me just go on. Uh, exterior window flashings, right? Uh, what about this? Toilet seats and systems. Ooh, I wouldn't have thought right. of that. A bath panel, right? The hot water cupboard lining, right? Ceiling tiles. Oh. Tex textured ceilings, you know, the old Artex? Yes. Right? Uh, interior window, window panels, gutters and downpipes. Surrounds for fireplaces. Cladding on garages. Fence panels. Well, that's co that's actually still very common in garages yep. and sheds that just would yep. have been left outside. Yeah. Stormwater and sewerage piping, as well as you said, loose fill inf inf you know, insulation and you know partition information, and even water pipes. Oh God. So the the point I'm trying to make here is that you've got to assume my my, my going in assumption. You've got to assume any property potentially has asbestos mm. in it, right? And because of the fact that we've been importing, you know, sheets with asbestos, 10% asbestos in it more recently, even modern properties may have it. Now, the other myth, and it's repeated very often, is it's fine as long as it's not disturbed. Mm. Unfortunately, asbestos rots, mm. right? So it's deteriorating in situ. Right. So if it's on a roof... Or if it's you know in a roof space, um, it's going to be shedding fibres. You know, if you, if you're playing on a floor with with that's got vinyl on it, you know, you're a kid, you're playing, you could be picking up asbestos fibres. Mm. Right. Um, so the point the point is, you know, this this is you know everywhere. And the other point to make is, think of a renter. Think of somebody who's moving around from property to property mm. and you know spending some time. In a rented property, I wonder how many property investors have done an asbestos check of their investment property. They're not required to, although in the UK they are, but not here, right? So it could well be that actually property investors are not knowingly, possibly, um, essentially exposing tenants. Um, and you know, if a tenant moves from property to property, to property, how do you know which property it was that they mm. actually picked it up? But and where I get to in all of this is that asbestos is not natural, right? It's not something that naturally occurs in the environment. It has been put into the environment because of these um, events over the last 100 years plus, right? As in it's been dug out of the ground. It's been dug out of the ground and it's been flogged to, you know, construction industry. It's also in schools, Mm. A lot of schools were built around that same time, and they've got asbestos in them. And only in Victoria, where there is a bit of a program to try and remove asbestos out of schools, um, is there really any attention. In many other states, there's hardly any attention, right? Everybody is saying, shh, don't talk about it, right? Don't rock the boat. Don't disturb it. It'll be fine, right? And, and so Jill's conclusion, having looked at all of this, the, the, this story and spoken to a lot of people, is that one... The people working in the industry don't know about asbestos. So building, although they're meant to be trained on it, mm. most people aren't trained adequately. Most people can't list the 22, 23 different instances of asbestos, don't know what to do. You only need a few fibres. One of the other things that comes out, comes out is, you know, everybody says, oh, you have to have exposure over a long, long period of time. That's mm. not true at all, right? You can have one exposure event at one point in time and get just a few fibres that lurk, uh, basically make their way out through the lungs into the lining of the lungs, for example, which is where a lot of mesophilioma is. But it can also impact other organs as well. Mm. So it can be, you know, found in lots of different parts of the body later.
The treatment for asbestos-related disease, in particular mesothelioma, is horrendous, right? There is no good treatments. And if you think about the 4,000 a year that, that die, you've got to ask yourself, why isn't there more research being done? Why isn't this up at a sort of COVID level of response, right? Because, I mean, what, what we had, what, 1,500 people die over the last six months in, in COVID, right? Mm. 4,000 a year are dying from asbestos-related disease, and that can be lung cancer and other, and other forms too. But 800 a year die from mesothelioma. And there, look, there is a very cavalier attitude towards asbestos, I've noted, like that building inspector I was talking about. And yep. some years back, um, the house next to my, oh, it had a weekender, and the house next door was demolished to be rebuilt. And I knew that was a fibro box, so I knew that that had asbestos in it. I just happened to be up there that week, the Monday, when they started demolition. Um, I packed bags and left um, because the supposed specialists that were called in, and I, honestly, to this day, I really regret that I did not hang around and take photos and videos and and send this to council. It's, he's one of, you know, you can make regrets in life. This is one of mine. It's bothered me for a long time. Um there was the guy on the roof of the house ripping up sheets with his asbestos, you know, they, they wear those white suits and meant to be masked up and the whole bit. He had it stripped off to the waist, tied around his waist with the arms, so he was completely basically naked at the top. Skin cancer as well, you know, while he's at it, might go the whole hog. His mask was on the back of his head. <laughs> He's like one of these idiots that rides a bike with his helmet tied around the handlebars. You know, yeah. like he doesn't have a brain to um to. But <laughs> his mask was on the back of his head, and his and his safety overalls tied around his waist. Um, yeah. So I just packed up and left. I didn't want to be around. You know, and hopefully I'm not exposed through that already. You know, and I don't know what my my dad told me about this in the 70s. Believe it or not. So somehow I don't know how he knew mm. about it, but um. Mm. That, that's a cavalier. That is from someone who's been provided with the safety gear, you know, and obviously doesn't, just doesn't get the risk. So I, I hear what you're saying about, you know, this is just not taken seriously. Um, and that has to be around awareness campaigns, right? That, you know, if the message isn't getting through to even those who operate in the industry, I mean, that's pretty shocking. And look, people when they're younger tend to think they're bulletproof. You know, that. and uh, it's nothing. No, it's not. It's, it's it'll be fine. You know, uh, well, no, it won't be fine, right? You know, Jill died at sixty-one, right? Mm. She had her first symptoms a decade earlier, which was just a bit of a tickly cough, and she went to the doctor at that time, and the doctor said, "Ah, oh, it's fine. It's just um, asthma." Right? Mm. So they didn't actually take it seriously then, and it was only um, a local GP when she went back a few years later said, "I'm really worried. This doesn't sound like a normal." cough you know and he actually pushed her to go and get uh, more thorough screening um, otherwise she wouldn't have known for quite a lot later mm. so the medical profession don't know enough about it in fact we've got some medical people now working with us because they're saying uh, including one who's actually involved in the um, palliative care end and she says I see this all the time people have no idea right the medical profession don't know enough about it the building industry don't know enough about it I'm not sure that the politics plays well as well because, of course, it was New South Wales who actually stitched up the deal with James Hardy, so they don't want to talk about this, right? Uh, and it's interesting because we wrote to the health minister and said, we got a big issue about asbestos. We think this is a really important thing and the health industry needs to actually wake up and take seriously. He wrote back and said, nothing to do with health. Send it to Macaulay Cash because it's just a compensation issue. It's an attorney general issue, right? Oh, wow. So, so they don't want to dance on this. So that's why Asbestos Awareness Australia was formed. That's the charity that we created last, last year. And we've started now doing three things. The first is to put up all our research. So Jill's written 18 research papers mm. from the history of asbestos to the power, you know, why it is the way it is through to the reform agenda that needs to be there. We've also put up our research in terms of the consumer research that, that, that we did, right? And then in terms of advocacy and change, what we want is we want three things. The first is we want a general awareness campaign so that people are aware of it. Because if you are doing DIY, right, 
and a lot of people do DOI, or if you are an owner of an investment property, or if you are an owner of an ordinary property of a certain age, or if you're at a going to a school or to a university setting or to an industrial building, you could be exposed to asbestos and not know. Mm. So there has to be an awareness. The second thing is we think that there needs to be a change in the law so that property owners are required to get a proper asbestos survey done. So they know, and that could be either be done when you want to sell or let, or maybe it should be done for everybody because you've got to assume that asbestos is there rather than not, right? Mm. And I want to go back to the third wave. The third wave is the DIY community, right? Unfortunately now, more women mm. are being diagnosed with mesothelioma than ever before, yeah. which is com completely oh. against what they said 20 years was going to happen. That's because more women are now doing DIY. Yeah. And also, what I noticed too, the numbers of diagnoses that are actually going up. Yes, which correct. is like, totally against what you would imagine if this was just going to die down. Uh, you it's, know, as all these products, oh. you know, leave the. Uh, it's actually a record. You know, it's going up every year. At the yeah. Moment. And, and in fact, um, the auditors um, to do with the James Hardy compensation scheme were a bit coy in putting out the numbers because, <laughs> because they're going up, right? Mm. So a bit, a bit slow. But the point is, it's because of this DIY wave, right? And because a lot of women, and, and women do seem to have a particular pre risk to getting mesothelioma. They, that, you know, statistically speaking, it looks as though more women could be actually, um, you know, react negative. Don't know why. There's not enough research to know why. Mm. There's al also almost no treatment. So, you know, there's a little bit of immunotherapy stuff, but it's very early days. Otherwise, it's basically a severe operation. Um, you might lose a lung. Um, you might lose the lining of the lung. Um, th these are very debilitating. Mm. And, and I can tell you, having listened to Jill and struggling to breathe over the last few months of her life, and particularly the last month, when, by the way, she did interviews for the ABC mm. and Channel 9, and she also got a lot of media coverage with um, the AFR and the Daily Mail. So towards the end of her life, she really wanted to go, <laughs> go on a rave, right? And in fact, the amazing story here was that she was very, very ill and really was having great difficulty breathing. I read her the first two articles that were published, the one in the AFR and the one in Daily Mail. And that gave her enough of an impetus to do two more interviews. Wow. <laughs> and her last one for Channel 9, she did that two days before she died, right? despite the fact she could hardly breathe, because she wanted to get the message out of, of this need to reform. right? And, and, the, and so going back to the, you know, the, the charity, so a need to raise awareness a need to reform. The third is we have to get political engagement here. Mm. We can't have the politicians just walk away and say oh, it's a compensation issue, right? No, no, no. This is a really serious issue at both a federal and a state level. So the third angle of driving change is a political change where we want people to actually start, one, recognising how serious this is, and two, you know, making some changes. And just for comparison purposes, in the UK, you are obliged in the UK to disclose asbestos and you know test for asbestos none of that's here right so we are way off best practice but in the us they're still using asbestos today mm. so we're sort of in the in the middle of the pack and the problem we got if you really wanted to eradicate asbestos taken out of the one third of buildings right this is a huge huge cost well look right? at the problem we've got with flammable cladding you know, that's A, on the outside generally, and, and B, um, got a very small period of time with which it was actually used. It's quite, you know, contained, if you want to call it that. And yet that's there's a lot of buildings with that stuff still stuck to the outside of them. Yep. So asbestos is a lot more insidious in, in many ways, in many ways, in fact, but, but certainly 
you know, like you've got to have the expertise to actually go through each and every building to be able to actually identify areas where there's asbestos, and then and then what? And then what? You sort of, you know, you sort. I can understand why politicians were, oh, I stick my fingers in my ears, la la la, to hard basket, um, but this is not good enough, clearly. <laughs> If you like what you're hearing here, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars, please. Every review helps make it easier for other people to find us and hear what our amazing guests have to say. We love hearing your questions and we're planning more listener Q&A episodes. Please send your questions in. You can send them via the website, which is theelephantintheroom.com.au or directly via email to questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. Well, you know, what Jill's conclusion of all of this was they've traded off 4,000 deaths a year because it's easier just to allow people to die mm. rather than actually tackle the root cause issues here, right? And I also think there is a really big question about the sustainability credentials of the likes of James Hardy, you know, who are now, you know, positioning themselves under the ESG model of, you know, we are doing sustainably good things and we're environmentally friendly. Well, no, hang on a moment. There is a massive legacy here, which means that the shareholders of of James Hardy and the other players, right, need to wake up as well and ask some very hard questions of that organisation. Remember, they moved offshore and they left this sort of... um, uh, you know, legacy in Australia of effectively a, a, a fund which will run out of money sometime mm. in the future. It won't be sufficient to cover all of the um, compensation that will be required. And as I said, compensation is not enough, right? Because no. compensation is just saying, well, you know, your life is worth, I don't know, whatever it is, right? No. This is a much, much more serious issue. So to me, this is one of the most critical issues that we face in Australia. And anybody owning property, investing in property, uh, renting property need to ask the question of themselves is there asbestos because you could be actually be risking your own lives and the lives of your kids you know that's it's that serious and interestingly i've had a number of people say because of the shows that we've we've made on this of recent of recent times and jill's um appearance on um on the abc and things like that they actually went and got a survey of an investment property that they actually own and they were horrified to find that there was actually asbestos in the vinyl, mm. right? And so they've now taken steps to remove that. They wouldn't have done that, you know. In, so in a small way, we're already seeing some some change and people beginning to wake up. But but uh, 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 you know what amazes me is that people will still say, "Oh, you're making too much of this, right?" You mm. know, it's, it's not a big issue. It's an old man's issue. You know, it, it, it's back there. No, no, it's rising. Oh, uh, you have to have long-term exposure. No. You can be exposed one time, and that's sufficient, right? Yeah. And, and the death rate here is just horrendous. So this is a really, really big deal. And so the you know the wake up call really is anybody who's DIYing, anybody who's got property, anybody who's you know thinking of renting a property, ask. And by the way, most um, property inspections. They do a very cursory inspection. They'll put a little clause in the bottom saying we haven't been able to look at, um, you know, certain things. Mm. And funnily enough, asbestos is one of the things they quite often mention as, well, we we didn't really. So, So unfortunately, a standard building inspection report won't be sufficient to spot this. No, it's it. Absolutely right. I mean, there's been certain times we've actually commissioned a, a specific asbestos report because we've we've been aware of certain issues, and we certainly raise it when it's when we can see that look that needs to be dealt with by um, professionals. I know when I bought the house I'm in now, I've forgotten about the vinyl actually, but when you said that, reminds remi- dropping my pen here, uh, <laughs> reminded me that my building inspector said to me, I can't guarantee there's no asbestos in the vinyl. So, well, that's the first time I'd heard of that. Um, yeah. And I actually said that to my builders too when they started the demolition. I said, look, I'm just concerned that, they're, you know, I want you to make to be a, very aware of this and take appropriate precautions. They're very responsible builders, so I have no doubt that they did. But that's... There are certain properties that it's really obvious, and I, I always talk to the, you know, the friable and non-friable, and there's this, um, the 
the idea, and and this is something from reading also the report, one of the reports on your website there, which we will put in the links um, here. It was that the the non friable thing, um, and friable and non friable basically means that you you got to it's got to be sealed so yep. th- that little fibers can't fly off. So typically speaking, people will look at that and go, well, make sure it's painted, you know, in really good condition, right? But if you got on the roof, a, a it's exposed to the elements, you have a hailstorm or a really bad wind or something, and it's already decomposing. Like it, that you can just walk past a house and get exposed to it without even realizing it. So this is something that we do need to all be aware of. But I think what is particularly alarming, Martin, and you've you've articulated it really well, is that the gestation period, if you call it that long, um, is so long that that urgency is not there. And we are never good at dealing with things that are in the future. I mean, you know, that quote from Homer Simpson, oh, that's a problem for future Bart. I sure don't envy that guy. The, you know, it, it's very easy to push into, oh, look, it's not going to happen now. So, okay, so from individual point of view, if we own a property, we should check it. We should actually get, we shouldn't check it. We should get a, a corporate inspector to check it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I say to people is assume that asbestos exists mm. rather than assume that it doesn't exist. Yeah, definitely. Right. Particularly, now, now, also I just want to say that in, in uh, 1987, the, uh, the, he, that is the magic number or the magic year where I think they stopped using asbestos in fibre uh, cement products. Is yep. that correct? Yep. But 2003, there was another ban. Um, yep. What was that for? Well, because effectively the, the, the first was um, to do with the manufacturer and the second one was to do with the use. Oh, God. Wouldn't you think they'd go hand in hand? So you would have thought yeah. you've got a sixteen-year period of time where products could still be used, um, yep. and so that's not that long ago. <laughs> We're no. talking less than twenty years now. Absolutely, and, and of course the issue is that quite often, you know, a property could be refurbished. So mm. you know, you, you might have be you might be in a property that looks more modern than it is. But in fact, underneath it, you've got an older property, right? For example, uh, and the, and the other point there is that um, there's still a lot of old property that's still going to be refurbished ahead, right? Mm. And as we said earlier on, unfortunately, the people who are actually involved in doing the refurbishment don't necessarily follow the rules, don't necessarily do all the dust, and the dust can persist, mm. right? So even you know when when it, when it's finished and you've got this new modern property. You don't know whether there might be some some fibrous dust around, right? Because it hangs around. And the other point about sealing it and painting it, right, it's very, very uh, uh, proven now that that is not sufficient to control it, right? Mm. Um, And unfortunately, it's one of those mythologies. So there's a few mythologies, right? The first mythology is an old man's disease. It's fading away, don't worry. The second one is you need long exposure over many years, the third one is as long as it's encased and sealed, it will mm. never be a problem, right? None of those three are true. But interestingly, that was the playbook that they used in the US. Mm. And it's the playbook that was then brought to Australia and is still being replicated today. And if you talk to a lot of medical people, if you talk to a lot of politicians, if you talk to people in the construction industry, they will recite back to you those three um, myths, right? So, in a way, the industry has been very successful in portraying a particular story about asbestos, which is not the full story, right? I have to say, so the first two I was aware of, the third one, the the non friable versus friable, like the actual painting it and sealing it, I was no. not aware of that. So, I will no. change what I, I mean, I obviously tell people to get advice from people who know what they're talking about um mm. talk about in general terms but in general terms i have spoken around that to make sure you get someone who's a specialist in and make sure that it's concealed blah 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 i think make sure it's removed is a better idea Re- um, rem- removal is the only the mm. only safe option right and, and obviously that can be quite disruptive yes but it's the only way to do it. and it has to be removed in the right way so effectively you have to control the dust you have to be able to make sure that it's actually packaged up and the worry of course and this is unfortunately happens quite often a lot of asbestos is dumped i know right so yeah. it may be removed but then it's just sort of thrown around the corner and thrown you know into the bush somewhere right and that means that all of that fiber is there and, and shared 
for the public to ha- get hold of. Ex- exactly. But listen, okay, so then, and, and this is, th- that's true. I've seen, you know, there's various Four Corners reports and things like that. Um, so if it's removed by somebody who actually wears half of his protective gear, it's probably going to be dumped, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> probably. You probably, there's probably a correlation there, right? Um, how do, if you are going to go and, and tackle this and say, right, I want to check, I want to get a... Um, someone who is qualified in this area to check whether I have it in my property, then I'm going to get it removed professionally by people who do it the right thing and then dispose of it appropriately. How do you make sure, what, what sort of accreditation system is there in place to make sure that you're not dealing with a rogue? That's a very good question. The answer is there's not, I mean, they should be licensed, right? Mm. But, but the whole licensing process is full of holes and uh, there aren't that many people who I think have the full credentials to be able to handle this appropriately. So, you know, there are a few fly by nighters that claim they can do it and then just dump it. There are others that are really, really good. Uh, but interestingly, um, they tell you, they will tell you stories of them trying to compete with people who only do half mm. a job and will charge a lot less because this costs. Yes. And this is the thing. I mean, I know that, you know, it used to be it might cost, say, $20,000 to, re- to remove or demolish, uh, you know, maybe a garage with asbestos in it. It might cost you 5000 bu- $5, to demolish it if it has no in- asbestos in it. And then, of course, then it's a competitive space and you get the cowboys that come in, don't do the right thing, charge you 10 um, And And I've known that the, the cost has dropped, has, you know, of and it's been put forward by the industry well, you know, potentially, um, oh, well, that's because there's more more players and that brings the cost down. <laughs> but maybe it's just, anyway, maybe it's because there's um, not enough regulation. No, the, re- the regulation is inappropriate in my so, view. And, so, and, and the interesting question is, well, it's a state-based thing, right? So each state has its own regulations. The regulations are different in different states. Um, the disposal processes are a bit different in different states because basically you have to bury it ultimately mm. and but the problem i've got is that even some of the places it's buried it's not really you know long-term storage as it were and, and the point is that those they're still going to go on de- degrading so you know th- this, this is this is a horrible product that's got a legacy you know it's almost in the same class as um, you know nuclear waste you mm. know you've got to think about it like that and that's not how it's thought about no and I guess it's also a problem with this, with your solution. Your solution is basically, you know, that it'd be great to get it out of every single building, yet clearly, logistically and capacity-wise, that's not going to be possible. So there's got to be a, a level of, you know, prioritisation. Yep. Um, how, what has happened in the UK that hasn't happened here? Why is it more, uh, is there a higher degree of awareness and it's taken more seriously? I, I reckon they're about 20 years ahead of us in terms of so so the, there were people earlier talking about it raising awareness um and uh, the politicians finally got on the bandwagon and said we have to do something about this so so but it took 20 25 years for that to happen so we are a long way off that and it, look there are some really good websites that talk about general awareness some um councils have you know little bits of information on their websites with little cartoons of houses to show mm. you all the play. So, so there is information out there but if you are not activated to go find it go look that's go the ask. thing yeah and and so i keep talking about how do you activate how do you get people to actually mm. that's why i say stop assume it's got asbestos in it that's that's the first point right the second is asbestos kills right it could kill you right and your kids mm. right so on that basis, right? And not nicely and not quickly. Well, uh, quickly actually is, is rather rapid in the sense it, that it's you know, rapid, you, but the, within the, five the, years, the but. journey is a long one. And I can tell you, having you know witnessed Jill's death and the battle that she had at the end, she did not want to die. She hung on and hung on and hung on, and her breathing got worse and worse and worse. She was on oxygen for the last um, month all the time, and uh, you know her breathing got worse and worse, and ultimately she just couldn't breathe, uh, and that's when she died. Um, I don't want anybody to go through that. No. And, and, and that's the context for the risk trade-off here, right? Because what you're doing is you might save a bit of money now, you know, and you might be able to do a cheap reno and, you know, paint it over, over the cracks, as it were. But if in the process you got exposed or your kids got exposed or the tenant got exposed, right, mm. you've, led a, you've laid a legacy there. And the costs to the health system 
through the very you know, long process of operations and everything else and the chemotherapy and the radiotherapy. It costs a lot of money mm. just to try and treat this later, as well as, of course, the fact that the, um, the, you know, the outlook is, is pretty bad. And there are people who actually survive longer. So there are people who do survive more than you know, five years or whatever, but it's quite rare. Most people die earlier. And that's the other point. A lot of people, when they're di diagnosed with this, they know they've only got a short time to live. So the last thing they want to do is to make a big fuss and try mm. and sort of change the world. What they want to do is, you know, enjoy the last month. So it's quite interesting. Quite often when we speak to other sufferers, they say, really applaud what you're doing, but we mm. couldn't do that. So there is a really important, you know, point here. And, and, and mm. I come back to this simple point, right? You, I, you can't leave it to government. You can't leave it to James Hardy, right? You can't leave it to other people. This has got to be a community-led thing. This has got to be me and you and other people who are involved in property saying asbestos is important as an issue. Think about it and assume you've got it and then make sure that you deal with it appropriately. And if you can basically get the report that says, no, you're fine, fine. But you can't assume asbestos doesn't lurk there. And by the way, it's also in high rise as well as low rise. So just, oh, yeah. It's not just houses, right? Yeah. Oh, it was vermiculite, right? So remember those those spray on um, ceilings that yeah. are once again fire retardant, um, yeah, uh, insulation absolutely. for noise, and yeah. all the rest of it. That's yeah, yeah. There's asbestos in a lot of that. Absolutely. As we right. forgot about uh, well, asp asbestos was fire resistant, so it was often used for fireproof um, fireproofing between floors in high rise. <laughs> sort of ironic, isn't it? You got this flammable cladding property on the problem on the outside. You <laughs> but sorry, we shouldn't laugh. It's not well, a laughing. You, you, I think you've got to laugh a bit. So you know, Jill was of the view that um, this is really, really serious. But we also, you know, we're just we shook our heads in amazement and we chuckled about it because th th this is such a big issue and it's such a failure of government, a failure of corporate governance, mm. a failure of, um, you know, at all sorts of levels. And unfortunately, individuals are being left to pick up the pieces, you know, mm. either either by way of, of early death or indeed, um, you know, trying to deal with asbestos. And we know, you know, in the ACT, for example, with Mr. Fluffy, right, there are still houses that are being demolished because they've still got it and the only they can do is just demolish the whole house. I mean, it's, it's, it's a shameful story. It is indeed. Um, now, I want to, I don't know, I want to be able to do something a bit more concrete, but, you know, let's put this out there and, and do a bit to raise awareness and keep raising awareness. I know certainly in my business and, and Home Bar Academy as well, you know, we, this is, you know, teaching people to be aware of these risks when you're buying property, renovating property, renting property, as you say. Um, and if we are individually aware of the risks, then we're more likely to do something about it. And it's a very, very grave risk. Um, yeah, Martin, I really appreciate you sharing this with us. I know you're on a on a bandwagon, and and, and you know you've got a you've got a absolute purpose behind this, and I, and you know it's personal, obviously, as well as um, professional. Well, Jill's legacy, you know, if I can have anything to do with it, will be to deal with the scourge of asbestos once and for all, right? Mm. And I'm working with a number of other organisations. We've created Asbestos Awareness Australia. And if you go to that website, you can get a load of information. All her mm. reports are up there. Um, we're also uh, gratifyingly receiving a number of donations. We're a registered charity and uh, people can actually make tax um, deductible donations to us. That's really helping us to be able to do more in terms of the, the publicity and the other mm. things we're doing. We're going to do a lot more. Um, and we're going to work with a number of other organisations that also share, you know, our thoughts here. We're also working some, with some academics in terms of doing further research. Um, so we're trying to sort of pull the levers. But like I said, this is a community effort, right? Because we can't leave it to government. We can't yeah. leave it to the corporates to solve this. Um, and, and really, my message is, any time that you're interacting with a property, think asbestos. You know, just remember asbestos can kill and unfortunately, it kills in a very, very nasty way, and yet it's totally avoidable. And that's the final point I want to, to make, right? This is not something that has to be this way, right? It, it is solvable, right? It's a man-made problem, and therefore it can be cleared away, but it takes effort. Like so many of our man-made problems, <laughs> exactly. like the climate. Uh, let's just, you know, we keep <laughs> messing up with stuff and the money gets involved. and oh, yeah, dear. Yeah, Now, exactly. 
I would normally ask you for, for a Dumbo, but I guess, you know, I've given two Dumbos myself for those, you know, the building inspector and the asbestos removal guy. Um, have you got a Dumbo for us or yeah. shall we? So, yeah? so, well, no, no, I, I have got one insofar mm. that Jill and I both did renovations together, right? I, as a building surveyor, knew more about asbestos than she did, right? And I always wore the mask and the other protective stuff. Wow. And if she Jill didn't. didn't, right? She said, oh, look, it's all right. You know, I'm young. I'm fine. It's not really an issue. You're making a big fuss. And she accused me again and again of being overcautious and making a fuss, right? You get accused now, of that all the time, don't you? <laughs> Different reasons. <laughs> well, it has been. It has been. Uh, but the, the, the point oh, I, I really want to make is, you know, in hindsight, she actually, in some of her interviews, said, if I had known now what I'd known then, I would have not done DIY. Mm. And if I had done, I would have used the right precautions. And, you know, and she actually said, I was right. <laughs> so that's, that's a hollow victory, though, isn't it? <laughs> it is a, ho- it's a horrible, hollow victory, but I'll, yeah. I'll take it. But the, no, the, point, yeah. the point I want to make is I think she was reflecting what a lot of people think mm. that, yeah. you know, I'm young, I'm fit, it's fine, you're making a big fuss, it'll be fine. I'm invincible, what are the odds? Exa- exactly, and unfortunately she played the odds and lost, as 4,000 people a year are doing, right? Mm. It's not good odds. So for that purpose, you know, the, 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 the Dumbo is not taking it seriously. Yeah, yeah. Well, Martin, thank you. Um, let's do what we can to get the, your, you know, Jill's legacy of, raising asbestos and actually being able to to actually prevent this preventable disease you know like and and like you said, uh, from my point of view as a as a as a as a you use the word victim i mean she's she caught it got it um that must be horrible to think this is preventable i am yep. dying from something that that really no one should die from she, she actually used the word murder Mm. Right. She felt that she'd been murdered by it. And, you know, whether you, you go that far, I don't know. But she felt so strongly that it was completely preventable, right, mm. that it should not be going on. And 4,000 people a year should not be dying mm. because of this product and the way it's been treated and handled and not, you know, the information not shared appropriately. So on that basis, there is an opportunity to make a difference. Jill's legacy Mm. was that she wanted other people to take a different path. And so Asbestos Awareness Australia is all about trying to help solve this problem. So, as I said, we put the link to asbestosawarenessaustralia.com.au in the show notes. I encourage you to go there. Um, it's obvious her academic, um, you know, qualifications in the way that it's put together and research <laughs> and the, the yeah. papers that are in there. Um, it's you know, I, look, I read this sort of stuff because I'm interested, but I just think forget whether someone's interested or not. This is really critical well, that you understand. I'll just tell you one last thing. Jill tried to get those papers published in academic circles, right? The academic circles would not publish them. And the reason they would not publish them was because there are industry players who fund the universities. Oh, Right? Oh. So that's one of the reasons why we put all this information up on us best of Wednesday Australia. So her papers are there, including all the referencing. It's a very big academic exercise, but it's there mm. for a purpose because she had no other way of sharing all the information that she actually accumulated over that three years of, of academic research. So that's why it's where it is. All right. We'll go there and check it out. Thank you, Martin. I wish we had brighter things to talk to you about, but let's, let's get this conversation going. Well, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for giving it the attention it deserves and uh, really appreciate it. If you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or North Shore, my team and I can help you buy without regrets. Reach out via my website, gooddeeds.com.au. If you're looking to buy your first home, thinking of upgrading into a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, my team love to carefully guide you on this journey. And most importantly, get the finance right. Reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you again. And remember, don't be a dumbo.